Hello, everybody. My name is Carrie Emsler, Principal, Redwood Shores Elementary School. Many, many of you know me. I'm looking at our attendees here and I'm seeing some wonderful faces and names um, that I know and I miss dearly. So I hope everyone is doing well and having a good evening. Uh, and I wanna thank you for taking time out of your week um, and your night to come and listen to us share about BRSSD's reopening plan, as well as Redwood Shores Elementary School SEALs reopening plan. So I want Want to thank again you for coming. Uh, we'll have some more people joining us as we um, begin here. I also want to uh, welcome the cabinet members here that are with me, Superintendent Dan Deguara and Miss Rui Bao, Chief, Chief Business Official. Uh, we also have our, I think, coming tonight in attendance, a trustee vice president, Miss Amy Koo. So thank you so much for joining us and uh, supporting us in this endeavor um, and this wild ride. Um, so I'm gonna take a deep breath. My daughters tell me that I talk too close to the screen. So I'm gonna try to relax a little and get us started. Uh, it is um, with hope and excitement and a little bit, I'll be honest, a little bit of nervousness uh, that I share with you the plans tonight because overall, I miss seeing your kids. I'm an instructional leader and I love being here at an elementary school and we gotta get our kids back to school and I wanna see them so dearly. So tonight we're gonna share with you our plans and um, I want to be sure to communicate to all of you that these plans are an introduction. They are a working document. They are not a conclusion. So the plans that you see, even the ones you see today are different than the plan that I drafted a week ago. And if you're anything like me, you love to plan and, and have a plan and be organized. And I have learned through this pandemic that I have to be flexible and adjust my plans. So we will continue to adjust our plans in the best interest of our children following the guidelines of San Mateo County Health Department um, and leaning on the scientists and um, the, you know, the people that are not educators, I'm an educator. So we'll be leaning on people to help us make decisions to maintain the health and safety of our students moving forward. So with that said, I just want to um, share with all of you that I have begun the process of involving staff in this journey. We had a similar type meeting about a week ago, and we also have a small reopening uh, task force group um, among staff, and we'll be meeting again on Monday. And we've already put in some hours of work as well um, to engage the staff and do this in partnership and in collaboration. And I do plan on continuing that with all of you, community and stakeholders as well. So this is the beginning. Um, and I really look forward to your um, involved contribution. So I'm going to turn things over to our cabinet members here, and they're going to begin our uh, slide presentation and get us started in our dialogue tonight. So thank you all for coming. Great. Uh, thank you, Principal Amsler. Uh, good evening, and uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. I do want to take a moment to also thank uh, Board President Bopali uh, for joining us. I noticed that she was able to attend. Uh, so welcome, uh, President Bopali. And I um, want to just re-echo -e what Principal Amsler said, uh, the importance of being flexible, uh, adapting uh, to changing conditions. Um, I so wish, we also wish uh, that we had a crystal ball and could look into the future these days. Um, I will say that um, as we continue to adapt and continue to review plans and, and reevaluate and pivot, um, we continue to make um, improvements in the plan moving forward. So um, much of the information, some of the uh, model information that we'll share with you tonight um, are what we believe in, um, um, improvements to our instructional models. And of course, we will always make sure that the safety of our staff and our students um, our top priority. Um, we remain committed to that a successful 2021 school year. Um, I am exceptionally proud of all of our teachers uh, for their work uh, to step up to the distance learning platform uh, to uh, improve their practices from last spring and really provide a comprehensive education for our students. Um, it's, it's been a challenge for us all. In that same vein, I wanna thank our families. We know that you've had to make many adjustments 
um, around the house, um, adapting work schedules, all that, those, uh, those nuances to ensure that our, our children are successful and continue to be successful. So um, a big thank you to our community uh, for coming together. Uh, just a note, we are recording today's web, uh, webinar. It will be posted on our district website. Um, uh, CBO Bao is, is uh, gonna help us moderate the chat tonight. We'll answer your questions, make sure we have plenty of time for Q&A. Any questions that we don't um, have an opportunity to answer tonight, we'll be sending out an FAQ, a district-wide FAQ, um, likely tomorrow in my update, that'll have um, answers to all kinds of questions that have come up across all of our, um, our community forums. So uh, tonight we're gonna split our time. Uh, uh, Principal Amsler will, will take us through a few slides. Um, I'll share a couple updates and then we'll take uh, Q and A as we, we go through. Let's go ahead and jump in uh, with the first slide. And uh, really the first slide um, is talking about the elephant in the room, if you will. Um, as a district, we, we made the decision to move forward uh, with offer, offering a hybrid um, in-person option for families when we reached the orange or yellow tier. Uh, we were in the orange tier and now we've slipped back to the red tier with 5.7 cases per 100,000, um, putting us in the red and a positivity rate of 2.1% of positive tests. Again, both of those numbers are increases. Uh, the state kind of put a little holding pattern, um, rolled a majority of the state back to purple or red. Um, we are seeing a spike. Um, and uh, we remain hopeful that in the next few weeks, um, our community will um, continue to make positive choices to wear masks, uh, to curb travel um, where appropriate so that those cases and positivity rates can come down and we can hopefully um, be in the orange or yellow tier uh, to open on January 19th. Uh, we are still moving forward with our plan to reopen January 19th. If we're in the orange or yellow tier, uh, we will continue to monitor those rates and provide updates um, as uh, the weeks progress. Uh, but again, we're going to uh, maintain a positive outlook. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the state also, uh, let's go back one. There we go. Uh, actually, um, so there we go. It's okay, I can talk to both. Um, go, go ahead, forward one more, sorry. So there's been some quarantine recommendations. Uh, I think we got our slides a little bit overlapped, that's okay. Um, so the state came out with a quarantine recommendation um, just a week ago. And in that recommendation, they said that all, all Californians um, should plan a 14 day quarantine if they were uh, traveling out of the region, specifically out of the state um, or out of the country. Um, this with holidays comes, coming up uh, poses a, a bit of a dilemma while many folks are, are planning traveling, planning ski holidays and, and such. Um, there is a recommendation for a, a, a recommended 14 day quarantine, again, to flatten the curve. Um, we share that because if that recommendation remains in place as we open up, we will be asking families if you are traveling to work together with us and follow those recommendations, uh, which involve a quarantine. And we'll talk more about that um, uh, as we go through the presentation. Um, next slide. And uh, BRSSD has also drafted a reopening plan. Um, that plan is gonna be submitted to the County Office of Education uh, before Thanksgiving for feedback. Again, the plan will say uh, that we are looking towards opening on January 19th in the yellow or orange tier. Um, and we will make adjustments to that um, as needed. Uh, but the plan, as, as Carrie will talk about in a little bit, uh, details all of our health and safety precautions, details how we'll notify families and staff if there is a positive case, details um, all of uh, the instructional models and our phased in approach. Next slide. 
Uh, speaking of phased in approach, it is a requirement uh, that we phase in grade levels over time. We wanna get our students and our staff back into the routine of not only being on campus, but being on campus in socially different, socially distanced and different ways. So we're looking at a, a, an elementary TKK one phase in, followed by a grade two, three, followed by a grade four, five phase in. And these dates will be adjusted if needed. Again, I'm gonna say it again, we're still um, uh, working, uh, hopefully uh, looking forward to a January 19th um, opening. With that, I'll turn it over to Principal Amsler. <clears throat> Okay, so I am going to share with you uh, our reopening plan. I sent this out to the community earlier today. Um, and thank you, Rui, for getting that going for us. Thank you. Uh, and I'm not going to go through every detail of this plan. I just want to uh, show you it and acknowledge that it's here uh, and recognize, as I mentioned, that it is a draft. Um, but we have carefully engaged in the process of analyzing um, different elements of what we need to keep our children safe uh, in our um, school setting. So that includes the fancy terms of ingress or egress, which basically means drop off and pick up. Uh, and let me just say right off the bat that um, I did update this plan to include the recent development around the AM PM program. So that is something to be aware of and that is in this plan. But again, just samples of the times right now. This, the times are just um, a sample. So the plan continues and I'm not gonna go through every page at this time. Um, I encourage you to read it in all your free time uh, and uh, check it out, um, especially if you have questions. Both this plan and the, and the BRSSD larger plan, a more comprehensive plan can help to answer some of those frequently asked questions or perhaps um, help you gain a little bit more confidence or uh, knowledge to help you um, move forward as we, um, as we continue. So Ms. Rui, I think I'm gonna stop the uh, demonst showing the plan right now because the slides have a bunch of, bunch of this information. So we can go back to the slideshow. Thank you. I don't wanna repeat myself too much here. So one thing that I'm proud of in our plan is my uh, is the map because um, I did have to do the map. So you just saw a little picture of that there. Oh, thank you so much, Rui. So um, so this is the map that I made. Um, I think the colors are kind of cool, um, and the map just sort of helps you see some of our thought process regarding how we're going to get our students safely on campus and off campus. Now, this being said, after working with staff we already have another idea that is, they think is even better. So I didn't put that in this plan, but I just want you to know that we are continuing to reflect and refine and make it stronger. Um, so this is just one angle or avenue. Um, we have currently six open openings or gates on our campus. And so you can see that we have um, uh, some different areas where people can come into school. Um, and when children come to school, it's important for all of you to hear that at this time, families will not be walking students onto campus. They will be dropping off at their designated gate, saying goodbye and heading off to school. Um, we will also be doing a uh, health screening, a temperature check prior to them entering their classrooms, perhaps at the gate, um, and uh, you know, at the vehicle drop off. We will have a plan for walkers. We will have a plan for bikers. Um, a re recent brainstorm we're having, just to give you a little example, is we're thinking about maybe putting some bike racks over here on this corner by the field here. So we'll have a couple of different bike rack areas to maintain some social distancing um, and uh, allow people to have less uh, walking time, you know. Um, so again, we're continuing to brainstorm and grow, but the general idea is that um, we will be uh, keeping adults off the center of the campus and um, safely getting children into their classrooms and ready to begin on time. Um, we are also planning a pickup um, system, which my we did at my daughter's school, which I'm familiar with uh, having formerly worked there, which um, is dealing with a 
card in the wind windshield and you put the kid's name on it and it's color coded and then we got some walkie talkies and we um successfully and safely uh walkie talkie and get kids picked up in a safe manner um, and i am familiar with this process having done it at my previous uh, school site so um these are examples of things we're thinking about with pick up and drop off um Okay, we can head back, Ms. Rui, to the slideshow that talks about the instructional program. Back up a little bit. Thank you. Um, I actually moved the slides because I like to think, keep things wild, um, but also because for me, instruction and curriculum is very important. Of course, safety and health is also important, but I I know that some of you might be wondering about your particular child's teacher, about your particular child's educational program when they're at school. So I just wanted to, I put it at the top of the slideshow because I wanted to ensure that people got the message around the AMP model. And please, please know that this is a model that was created um, and developed in collaboration with our teachers through some design thinking. Um, and I am very much in support of this model. Um, I think as our uh, uh, educator thinking about, for example, our first grade kids, our first grade students having access to their teachers every day to learn to read and grow is just phenomenal. So I think the AMPM model is a great model for our students. Um, and I do think that we will be able to maintain high expectations with curriculum and rigor with our curriculum while also giving children the essential social interaction that they have been lacking for a long time now. So, um, so I'm happy and pleased with this new model. Of course, nothing will be perfect um, and we will remain flexible um, because, uh, because it's uh, you know an interesting time. Okay, so I wanted to make sure people knew that. I also wanted to make sure that um, you, you heard about that right away. And we'll talk a little bit more about your child's teacher and about the surveys later on in the, in the talk tonight, okay? All right, thank you for continuing forward with the slideshow. This is an example of the times. So we are doing a staggered approach. Um, I have heard from numerous educational leaders in the area that the best thing they do is a staggered start time and a phased in approach. The staggered start time will allow us to safely get kids into learning. Um, and you all know how our traffic can get pretty congested sometimes. So this is a way for me and our staff to manage the cars, to manage the pedestrians and get our kids into class in a, in a um, safe way. Okay, so those times are still samples and we'll continue to move forward with those. Thank you. Um, next slide, thanks. Uh, and then as you guys know, um, we are following the county health guidelines and the four pillars. You have seen me many, many times reminding students in videos about wearing our masks and washing our hands. And we got Cecilia here reminding people to wash hands um, and wear those masks. It continues, right? We will be educating our students. We will be training them and teaching them about these pillars. We will be putting up um, signs, blue tape. I've been thinking about or dreaming about a rainbow cone pathway where the kids get to follow the rainbow path along our blacktop. So we have lots of ideas and brainstorms about how to keep our children um, following these three pillars. Um, Face coverings is a very much important, um, and we will be requiring all students to wear face coverings and staff. Um, please let me say that again, face coverings will re be required for the duration of the school day, both inside and outside for all staff and children. There may be some children that have a medical condition or such that requires them to have an accommodation, and we will work with those families um, confidentially and individually. Um, so those are some examples of things that are brought up with that slide. I think we're ready to move on. Thank you. Mentioned some of these things before. Overall, one of the things that I'm we're talking a lot about is how to help our kids with their uh, school supplies and keeping them in a safe and organized fashion. We think about our hooks outside. We're thinking about baskets, Tupperware. How do we ensure that our students' materials are safe and sanitized? Okay, so that is something we're talking about, as well as having very clear bathroom um, schedules and bathroom routines. As a principal, 
who the bathroom, you know, there's always something going on in the bathroom. So this is something I have to tackle and something that the, this, the teachers are with me on to ensure that we're training the students about appropriate bathroom usage and how we um, designate certain bathrooms for certain children. Okay, so this is very much on the forefront of my mind. Um, and this is something we will continue to um, think about as we move forward. We can keep going. Um, I talked about our my cool map there. Um, this gives you an idea of our classroom setup. Um, thank you, Ms. Baldonado, for letting me use your class as an example. Uh, we can successfully keep desks and chairs in our rooms at six feet distance. Um, I like this model because it also gives the students a space to possibly sit crisscross applesauce on the ground if they would like a little, you know, different seating option. But the general idea is that they will be sitting in their desks um, and we will have a flow and pattern for how they move about the room to maintain space. They will also be trained in how to hand wash within the classroom. Um, and following you know patterns of movement that allow the students to be physically distant while also hand washing and um, lining up in the classroom thank you uh, i mentioned the face coverings um, that's important as well as um, our uh, health and hygiene practices regarding our ventilation so ventilation is important we will have windows and doors open as much as possible um, as well as uh, all of our rooms even our small specialist rooms are equipped with merv 13 filters which are hospital grade filters and um you know who, who knew a year ago that I would know about MERV 13 filters, but now I do. So that is something that our school has, and we will continue to uh, be vigilant about maintaining those the um, ventilation of our school. I think that's it. Okay, cleaning and sanitizing. Ah, the exciting thing about this is there is, I did not know either, but I've learned a difference between cleaning and sanitizing. So the power of being able to do an AM PM model is that now our custodians have access to some new types of sanitizing sprayers and they look like these red blue really cool spray things and they fog out this very cool sanitizing mist that is made with EPA approved disinfectant and um, really good quality disinfectant sanitizer to spray in the room to sanitize our classrooms and um, the, our custodians mr ernesto and mr ray have been showing me and i've watched them sanitize our rooms it can be done quickly and it can be done safely that being said we may have some paper clips on the floor we might have a little pieces of paper here or there those things will be sanitized they'll get sanitized in between the two class sessions a.m. p.m. Um, so that is why it's going to be sanitized but perhaps not perfectly clean um, with like a humongous you know you might see a few things on the classroom floor when you come in um, I think those are the main things oh the bathrooms the central spaces the um, sinks the faucets they will all be sanitized on a regular basis and I maintain the schedules of the custodians and I work collaboratively with them I think that's it. Um, should we stop for some questions? What do you think? I think that'd be great. Uh, Just to spice it up a little bit here. Questions. Let me look at the chat so I can see if we have some questions that we could address. I covered a lot of ground there, but it's you know, nice what, to take a break. What, I was going to say, while you're looking at the, while you two are looking at the chat, I will share. Um, and I always forget to say this, as we're having these presentations, we, we tend to be focused on the in-person learning, the hybrid model in these conversations. Um, but please um, uh, don't forget, we will have two models uh, that we will offer families. We will offer families the ability to continue um, in distance learning, uh, pretty much status quo. There could be a few changes in terms of schedule and, and definitely some teacher changes but pretty much um, the same. And we have the option for families uh, to attend uh, in person in a hybrid model um, with roughly a two and a half hour block um, is how we're scheduling it. Um, we, we get a little questions probably in the chat or, or coming soon. You know, how do you compare a two and a half hour in-person hybrid day to say a three or four hour 
um, distance learning um, day? And how do you compare those minutes? And um, honestly, it's, it is very difficult to actually compare. Um, in the distance learning, there will be 30 students per class, just like there, I should say 24 to 30 students, depending on the, the age range um, within the class. In in-person model, there will be um, roughly half the number of students. So that'll allow uh, teachers to adapt um, a little bit. Uh, there will be um, some homework and some follow-up uh, for the in-person uh, folks when they go home. There will not be um, recorded or um, asynchronous lessons. Um, it'll be more of a shortened day with some homework, but that consistency that happens every day will help our, kid, our kiddos um, grow at a, at a continuous rate. And that's um, really the important piece. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it really depends. Uh, some students are going to be fine continuing to learn in a distance learning platform. Um, others um, are going to prefer that in-person connection uh, with uh, their teachers. Uh, speaking from a dad's perspective uh, with two boys, um, each of my boys learns differently and um, would probably have a tendency towards a dif dif different style of learning. So um, really important for families to think about their children individually, um, as well as um, uh, comfort level with, with in-person learning. Um, could you guys speak to, for families that opt for hybrid learning, what the asynchronous time will be uh, when students are not on campus? Sure. Uh, so hybrid learning, asynchronous time when they're not, a, not in, in class. So we envision our students coming to school uh, for roughly two and a half hours. Uh, they, teachers will likely focus on the critical standards, the most important elements, um, those direct instructional pieces. And then our students will have uh, the opportunity to go home uh, and practice those skills in a homework um, type of, of, of model. Um, and uh, specials that typically occur outside of this, um, specials like the science and the PE, those will continue to occur similarly at home like they do now. Uh, so it, it will be a blend of, of in-person learning and some asynchronous time uh, mixed with homework. Could you guys also clarify, I'm seeing a lot of questions around um, whether families and students will be able to keep their teacher um, and how that assignment will work. Yes. Uh, would you like me to clarify that, Ms. Amsler? Uh, so yeah, go for it. Go for it. It is a puzzle. I will, I will just share it as a puzzle and we're gonna do our absolute best. Um, our priority is to keep our students with their teachers whenever possible. So when families make their choices uh, coming up here in the next couple of weeks, um, they're gonna have a, a variety of options. One of the options is to stay with my teacher. And um, if you choose that option, we will prioritize you to stay with your teacher, regardless of if your teacher goes hybrid or if your teacher goes distant. Uh, for the most part, we anticipate um, being able to honor that request. There could be um, a chance that there's, there's a shift um, and that might not be possible, um, but largely speaking, if it's possible, we're gonna honor that request. Um, a lot of people have been asking me about how we're assigning our teachers. And I, I do wanna talk uh, just a moment about that. Um, we are working um, with our staff. Uh, there's um, criteria to which teachers um, are able to teach in person. Some of our teachers may have a health condition that prevents them from teaching in person. Um, and we may need teachers um, in certain areas um, that uh, are not their preference. For example, we may have a teacher that wants to come back to hybrid instruction, but the need may be a class that's in distance learning. So we'll um, need to make some of those adjustments uh, with staffing and then match students um, accordingly. Families that um, are opting for hybrid, uh, we are gonna absolutely do our best to honor those preferences. There is the chance that we will not have enough um, hybrid spaces 
um, for all the families wishing hybrid. However, if a family does wish distance, um, we do anticipate um, accommodating all families who choose distance learning. Um, and that's simply because uh, due to health conditions and certain factors, um, teachers can shift from hybrid to distance, but they can't necessarily shift um, from distance to hybrid. So it is a delicate puzzle um, that we're working through with staffing. Um, I'm gonna add one more piece if that's okay. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to family choice, so I talked about staying with your, your classroom teacher. Um, outside of that, we want you to think about uh, your family's comfort. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to select hybrid instruction or distance learning. Um, actually via our town halls, we got a lot of questions about, um, can I select AM or PM? And initially we said, no, that wasn't gonna be possible. Um, we've done a, a little bit of work um, and really the feedback came back. Um, I remember this comment and, and it was from a father who said, um, some of the parents uh, do work with Asia or Europe and that influences the AM PM. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we're, we're gonna allow a little bit of flexibility there. Families will have the opportunity to select AM or distance learning or the option for PM or distance learning. And um, if they just want distance learning at all costs, uh, they'll have um, that option as well. So a little bit of, of choice and that'll all be very clear in, in the information that comes out. Uh, Families will be receiving um, the survey coming up here next week. You'll have uh, plenty of time to think about it, to respond to it. The survey is gonna be binding and I'm getting ahead of us already. The survey is gonna be binding um, for when we return in an orange and yellow um, uh, tier. We've heard our community, we've done a lot of surveys. Um, it is time to make those choices. So under a, your survey will be um, used uh, your choice will be used for whenever we move forward in a yellow or orange tier. I'm gonna stop there. Uh, another question that's been coming up a lot is around testing and testing protocol when we return to in-person instruction. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming you mean it's not, it's not uh, COVID testing, not statewide testing. Correct. So yes, yeah, so we, uh, I can speak briefly on this and then you guys can add in. Uh, we just started this week with um, voluntary COVID testing for uh, staff who would like to, and I was the first to, to do that and go through that experience. Um, we are working with an organization called Curative and they are helping us with our testing for staff, which I believe will be, um, it's my understanding, it will be every two weeks um, and on a, uh, working with the district wide um, to ensure that we're um, testing our staff. Right now it's voluntary but later on it will be a part of our of our practice as employees um and that is what i know right now um superintendent would you like to add to that uh sure you know what i i i just share the caveat the state is recommending testing for all school employees once every two months the county is recommending once every month we've um even up that a little bit more we're testing once every, once every two weeks or twice a month. And then for employees um, that are in um, a little bit higher risk settings, uh, working with students um, that may have more difficulty keeping on masks uh, and face coverings, uh, the opportunity for even more frequent um, uh, testing. In terms of, of student testing, I do wanna mention San Mateo County um, does have curative testing available for families, um, for students. Uh, we are unable to, to mandate um, or do student testing, but families can take their students, uh, their children to the county uh, for free testing. If you have insurance, they do ask you for that information. If you don't have insurance, um, it, is, it is supported via the CARES Act at this point in time. Uh, so it is, is virtually um, free uh, for folks to do. And we will encourage families uh, to test their children. We will likely set up opportunities in district uh, for families to participate in that as well. Okay. I saw a 
couple of questions that I wanted to address. Um, there is a um, definite commitment on my part to ensure that we are including all of our students on campus. So we will be working with our classified staff, our paraprofessionals, uh, to help us with such things as meeting students at the gate uh, when they say goodbye to their parent and helping them that may have a mobility issue or a concern to um, help all students get to their classroom safety safely. Um, as well, we are working with our behaviorists and our paraprofessionals to engage in um, uh, placing them or having them work with the class group of 12 students, and that will be their cohort of students that they work with. So we will continue to do everything in our power to um, provide the support and supervision that students have in their IEPs um, uh, based on their needs. So that is in a work in progress and we'll continue to ensure that that happens for our children in need. Um, and another other people asked a little bit about um, children that are presenting symptoms of COVID. Um, so I am continuing to be educated myself with um, our special programs department and the cabinet regarding um, what this means. So we have a very clear current um, this flow sh flow chart where the font is like size six font, but it has all these arrows. And so it's going to teach me and I'm going to be consistent with all the principals and all the schools in the district to ensure that we're um, following the same health survey regarding symptoms. So overall, it's my understanding that if a child presents two symptoms that could potentially link them to having COVID, they will need to go home. So there, those are the such things as runny nose, stomach ache, fever of 100.4 or more. Um, so there's a whole list of them. Um, and we are following county guidelines on that. And I'll work closely with our nurses. Um, anything to add to that? Yeah, I will. I will add. I'll piggyback onto that because, um, yes, in in our reopening um, uh, book, which you guys have links to, um, is a, a, a chart, and I, I can visualize it in my head, of of certain symptoms that if you have those symptoms, you automatically need to stay home. I.e., um, if you have a loss of taste or smell, that is an indication you need to stay home. If you have a fever of 100.4, that is an indication you need to stay home. There's other symptoms like runny noses, a cough, um, uh, uh, sore throat, that if you have a combination of two or more of those symptoms, you need to stay home. And I, I call that out because um, some of those cases, we might have opted to send our children uh, to school thinking it's a common cold, that's just normal for our kiddos. Um, in the era of COVID, uh, we will not be able to send our students, our children to school if they're exhibiting those symptoms. So just something to think through um, as we, we move forward. Um, again, you know, I, 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 I bring up the idea of those travel um, restrictions and recommendations, and that is because we um, want to make sure that um, all of our children stay healthy, right? So it's it's upon it's incumbent upon all of us to keep our kids home when they're sick. If we're traveling, um, be cautious, uh, and we will do our best to work with you. Um, that said, anytime students are out of school, um, it is it is not easy. Um, we will do our best to provide work and homework. Um, if you're in the hybrid model. Um, and you are in, in a quarantine that's not related um, to your classroom for outside reasons, um, you do not automatically shift to the distance learning model. Um, you stay home through that 14 day quarantine. We do our best to support your child with homework um, and work packets where, where possible. Um, and um, it, it, it is difficult, and that is, is one of the concerns that we all have. Um, one of the best things you can do proactively right now is, is go visit your pediatrician, get those flu shots, uh, try and minimize um, uh, potential illness as we move through the uh, cold and flu season. Maybe we should um, just make sure we address the rest of the slides and then yep. um, end with a couple more, you know, a few more questions at the end. So let's go back to the slideshow, um, slideshow, slide presentation. 
thank you all. I know that there's a lot of questions and um, some questions could really lead me down into the nitty gritty. Um, and as much as I love the nitty gritty, um, I don't wanna go down too many tangents. Um, so I'm gonna try to stick to the plan here. Um, and I appreciate the questions. Let's see here. Uh, superintendent was able to um, touch on a bunch of these elements before. Um, I know people are definitely wondering about teachers um, and I will um, send, you, many of you know my email, hopefully you know my email, um, but you are welcome to email me with questions um, regarding your child's per individual needs. Um, I cannot address specific HR matters, but I can at least um, answer questions that you might have regarding your child's um, placement or what you think might be best. So I am available if you have questions. Um, and uh, I think those are the main things that have not been addressed yet. Um, let me see, I'm just looking through here. We've got this window in which, oh, prior to this window, we are having a webinar that BRSSD is putting together with a panel of medical professionals to update families on the current situation to help you feel that you've gotten some more information um, as you fill out your survey. Anything you all would like to add to that? Uh, sure. Uh, within the window, so actually that and, it, and the dates on the next slide, and we'll be sharing it, uh, is November 30th. So it's actually in the middle of our preference window. Um, and what I would say to that is, if you absolutely know hybrid or, or distance learning, respond to the survey um, as, as quickly as you're able. We're going to be monitoring the data as it's coming in. Um, if you're on the fence or not quite sure, hang on till November 30th listen to that expert panel. We have um, a panel of, of pediatricians, um, county health, uh, county superintendent, infectious disease experts uh, to talk and answer um, parent questions. If you want to hang on and wait for that, absolutely do that and then quickly kind of respond. But you will have till December 4th. We hope people don't wait that long. Um, I do want to clarify, you are um, responding. Our current direction is to open with a hybrid model, hybrid option, if we are in orange or yellow. You are answering the survey, the binding survey, for, for an orange or yellow tiered opening. Uh, we will look forward to opening our schools for a hybrid option when we are orange um, or yellow. So orange comes along, we get there, we are gonna reopen with a hybrid model, okay? I know that was a couple questions that came up. Another quick clarifying um, question around temperatures. So um, it is 100.4, 100.4, as well um, being a Belmont United mother, soccer playing mother, I um, understand sometimes when we check the temperature at soccer practice, socially distanced, sometimes it's over like 98.6. So we wait a couple minutes and then we check the temperature again. So that is well within my planning and our planning to wait a few moments and check the temperature again. Um, so we are working in some time and some plans to ensure that we are trying our best to get a accurate read of a child's temperature um, as, as we move forward. Um, so that was another clarifying question. Some people were concerned or wondering about the, the exact temperature there. Uh, all right, let's see other, okay. Um, there's something that, I'm just looking this over here. I wanna make sure I give you the right information. I think we just talked about, okay, so, this is something that I've learned as well recently is that once we open school, let's say we open January 19th and we're in the orange, we open school. Once we open our doors and we make our plan happen, we have people on distance learning, we have kids in the hybrid, um, then once the doors are open, we um, will continue to work with San Mateo County Health to um, make plans accordingly. So. Superintendent Aguirre, could you explain that a little bit more? Even I find it a bit confusing. Um, and so it would be helpful if you can clarify that for us. Sure. Uh, the state has the tiered system, which we're all aware of. Um, however, 
um, there is a goal to have um, folks in education not bouncing um, in and out. And, and right now the, t the state says that it is safe uh, to open our schools under the red tier. However, we've, we've um, adopted a little bit more conservative approach, orange or yellow. But once we open um, our doors to in-person learning, we are gonna keep students and staff in that routine so long as we're able to um, mitigate and keep COVID out of our schools. So the, um, uh, the county health department actually determines once we open, whether or not we close. And it's determined based on our ability um, to keep uh, uh, exposure low. So if there's, um, broadly speaking, if there's one case at a, in a class, the class cohort will close in quarantine. If there's 5%, um, take the number of students participating, if, the, if there's a 5% rate of, of COVID positive, then a school would quarantine or close. If 25% uh, of a district's schools, uh, in our case, that would be two, um, were to close, uh, then the entire district would, would close in quarantine. But we um, would follow the San Mateo Health Department guidance. Um, I do wanna share that if there's a positive case, um, we don't um, just quarantine and, and wait. We actually follow a, a, pretty, um, a pretty stringent reporting protocol uh, that involves the County Office of Education and uh, Department of Public Health for every case. Um, and once we report that case, it's called a line log. And there's um, probably 25 to 30 data points that we collect daily for 14 days. And we track case rates to see if there's um, exposures, if there's contacts, if there's close contacts. Um, we're looking, uh, if, if there was a case, we would notify the community of that case. Uh, we would further notify the community if we suspected that they were a close contact. A close contact is determined um, by the amount of time you spend with an individual, uh, 15 minutes or more in a 24 hour period um, within six feet um, with or without a face covering. So largely speaking, even though our, our kiddos are gonna be keeping their social distance in their classroom, if there is a case, we are going to consider the class um, likely a close contact and, and would quarantine the entire class. Again, that is with the support of the Department of Public Health, and we would work very closely with them. I'm... I'm reading these slides carefully and just trying to make sure that we're taking them in. There's a lot of scenarios. I also have the chat box here with other scenarios. This is a question that I am a little bit stumped by. So I'm gonna bring it up because I like it. I don't have an answer. So maybe one of our cabinet members here will have an answer. Someone tests positive in the AM group of COVID. Does the PM group also close? I don't, I'm, I'm putting That's it out there. So, so yes, and here's why. Okay. So um, um, let's, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my Zoom screen, pretend I am the teacher. Uh, Miss Amsler is in my um, AM class and Miss Bao is in my PM class. Um, I am working very closely with Miss Amsler um, each, each day. We're in the same room for more than 15 minutes while we're keeping our social distance. Maybe we've compromised that six feet at times. We're in a, in a classroom. Um, so because Miss Amsler tests positive, um, I am considered a close contact and I too must quarantine. So if I am quarantining, um, Miss Bao, I can't teach Miss Bao in person, right? So that would force both sections uh, to quarantine. Miss Bao would not be considered um, a close contact unless I ended up testing positive, right? So there's contacts of contacts and there's close contacts. It gets really confusing, um, but really what we're worried in, about and monitor is the close contact. So 
Um, and it, it, it is somewhat of a domino. If Ms. Am Amsler tested positive, then I tested positive, that would mean Ms. Bao becomes a close contact and we, we, we continue down that path. And just to pile onto that, I'm seeing a few questions around when that happens. Um, what does that mean for instruction? So if an entire pod is quarantining, then that shifts to uh, the distance learning model um, because you are now not constrained by only having the 10 to 15 students. You can come together and will look much like it does now. Um, if it's one student who is a contact and that contact was outside of school, so soccer game on Saturday, a student becomes a contact, the cohort is unaffected, but that student does need to quarantine. And in that case, the student would receive independent study and asynchronous work. Another a few questions that came up were regarding substitute teachers. So I have worked um, with several substitute teachers this fall. Uh, and um, I know and I'm confident that the district is maintaining um, and training a substitute pool to help us. So I've had great um, experiences with substitutes this fall. And so I am confident that that, that substitute teaching um, situation will continue moving forward into this hybrid model. So for example, our substitutes attend professional development training with us. They receive the similar training as our staff. Um, and so, um, and I work collaboratively with the substitutes. That's where I really step in and help out a lot, um, making sure that our classrooms are um, supported with our substitute teachers. Um, I will share that families who have multiple siblings, um, if you choose the hybrid, um, model, we will um, make sure that both of your children um, have either morning or afternoon um, class. Uh, one little caveat, uh, because of the staggered start and staggered dismissal, uh, we do need you to be cognizant of those times. Uh, we are going to ask that you drop off your students um, really close to those times to eliminate um, kind of the, the loitering around, if you will. Usually that's the fun time at school, playing, connecting on the playground. Um, school is gonna look different in person, right? We're used to kind of collaborative groups and, and a lot of teamwork. Um, as you saw in the pictures, our, our desks look um, pretty traditional in rows facing forward. Um, we are um, doing our best to minimize um, contact outside of cohorts. Certainly kids need to walk um, back and forth to their classrooms and whatnot, um, but cohorts will not be um, intermingling. If uh, classrooms or when classrooms go out for a break, they'll be um, conversing and, and having a break um, with their classmates, again, socially distant. Um, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we have the four pillars guidance um, always functioning. And, and really, um, it is a redundant system um, on purpose to keep us all um, healthy and safe. We are getting towards the end of our evening. Um, there was a question about preschool. Uh, I am working closely with Laura Goldman and Sean Corso to ensure that our preschool um, is involved in our full plan. And uh, yes, it's my understanding that our preschool will have an AM class am cohort and then the pm there was one group that has pm and they'll be doing that via distance um so i will work in collaboration with special programs on our preschool um, to make sure they're involved in our drop-off pickup etc um one question that's come up and i i forgive me if i already mentioned this um with teacher preference um we often get asked well are we going to know who the teachers are uh, before we, we, we select our model? No. Um, and I'm going to ask that you don't ask your teacher um, what their preference or what they will be teaching. And here's why. Um, we are, um, again, working with um, all individuals and individuals may have health needs that put them in one, one situation or another. Um, and we want to do our best not to um, have our teachers feel that they have to disclose that information because that is private and confidential. Um, in addition, um, a teacher may not um, receive their preference um, uh, just because of a, a need maybe in another area. So um, uh, we will do our best uh, to match uh, staff and student preferences. 
Uh, there is the potential that families who wish uh, to have hybrid instruction may not um, have that preference honored um, because of, of, of staffing abilities. I am scanning the chat right now. Um, I understand that there's some questions that we're not gonna get to completely, um, but I do think we've covered quite a bit of ground tonight. Um, I look forward to getting more feedback from our stakeholders. Um, and that includes you guys. Uh, so there will be some, you know, I know some people have real interest in our safe routes to school with biking, walking, driving, ensuring the safety of our students in our community. <clears throat> so that is something that is in the forefront of my mind, as well as making sure that we have high quality instruction for our kids while they're here and an emphasis on social emotional learning. Many of you understand that I value um, promoting kindness and uh, emotional well being for our children. So I am hopeful and confident that by having our kids back, we'll be able to um, to develop that further. Now, many of you will choose a distance learning path. Um, I am a parent myself and I am facing the exact same decision. Um, and so I'm trying to really talk with my partner, my husband about what is our comfort level? What do we as a partnership um, want for our children? And um, I may encourage some kids to come back and I may have my kids home um, while I'm here at school every day. So, um, so I hope that we can go forward knowing that each family is doing what's best for them um, and for their children um, and that we can um, know that we are doing our community effort to comply um, and honor the pillars um, and to um, follow the rules um, because I much, much prefer to develop our community than um, have to run around grouchy all day, like telling people what to do, you know? So um, I am excited. I am hopeful. I am jazzed about the opportunity that this all brings us. Um, and yes, I have a kajillion questions too, and I am worried. And, um, and so I am riding this roller coaster with you and I stand with you um, and I miss your kids. And I want you to know that we are gonna do this um, with the safety of your children in the forefront of our minds with every single decision we make, okay? Um, it is now 6.59. Thank you for being with us. Uh, anyone wanna say anything before we wrap up guys? I just want to say thank you. A um, uh, big thank you to our community. Thank you uh, for the support that you've given and the continued support that, that we'll be asking you to give us. Um, I want to just say a big kudos and thank you to Principal Amsler. Uh, she is working exceptionally hard. Many times as she was sharing um, her energy and her excitement, uh, made me smile. A couple times she was saying, you know, I'm envisioning rainbow cones and I'm envisioning um, these kinds of things. Like um, that's really the heart of education is, is adapting and changing and, and creating uh, safe environments for our kids to learn in. So um, I definitely appreciate um, your hard work, Ms. Hamsler, and, and really all of the staff. Um, it is a community effort. So uh, thank you all. And I'll just say one last plug, have a happy um, and joyful uh, Thanksgiving coming up here in a week. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, families. I am grateful for all of you. Miss Rui, did you, Miss Bao, would you like to say anything before we wrap up? I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for managing the chat Whew. and the slideshow. Whew. My face would have been even more red after that. All right, guys, it is 7 p.m. Time is important. We are stopping on time tonight. Have a good night. Enjoy yourselves. Thank you, everybody. Go Seals. Whoop, whoop.